So we are here with uh, Kyle Hanslevan. Hansel Hanslevan. I said it wrong right after you told me how to say it, but that's all right. <laughs> uh, you're a malware connoisseur, a hacker of things, and CEO of Huntress Labs. And I first discovered when you done, did some research on Kaseya. And uh, so let's oh yeah let's uh, let's talk a little bit about that. You are like this is one of those things that's important to me and important to a lot of my audience. Is that okay? you know a few things, but you don't just know a few things. You've actually done a lot of things. It's, uh, I, I look at more of the actions that people have, not like a bunch of accolades on the wall, not a bunch of degrees from wherever. Those are cool, and validation of institution is important, but uh, let's see a couple other things we have in here. You are DEF CON 20 CTFs competition winner, is that correct? That is, yeah. I snagged a black badge out of DEF CON, so that was a pretty cool accomplishment. That's pretty cool. You... Uh, just a ton of articles, uh, in not just the Kaseya one, on uh, auto runs and playing all that. And that comes from your background of creating them on the offense. Am I correct? Yeah. So I cut my teeth. Uh, unlike a lot that start in defense and grow to offense, uh, I jumped knee deep into offensive security in the early 2000s. So there's a lot of things I'm bad at. Hacking things is one of the things I'm pretty darn good at. <laughs> and uh, you spent some time uh, playing hide and seek officially, though, with the NSA and, and creating, uh, doing some internal testing with uh, your in government engagements, too, correct? Yeah, so I, all the way from my time in the Air Force. So I, I got to spend a lot of time in the intelligence community in Air Force. I jumped out and uh, worked directly for the NSA, but was a contractor as well as, you know, a government employee. And uh, you know, here I am now at Huntress. So it's uh, been a crazy wild ride. Creating all these persistent threats and everything. And, and uh, one of the other things that is fascinating to me is I don't like security researchers who think that anything should be a secret. Uh, even in the latest Brian Krebs article, I see people calling it out that all these indicators of compromise are sometimes like wall gardens. Like, well, only I should know this information and it shouldn't be shared. And all these security researchers, you and many others, it, I'm seeing this bigger trend and I love it. You dump it all out there. This is the debrief on it, and this comes all the way to Kaseya. You gave a very good debrief, and kudos to Kaseya, like you said in there. You're not blaming them. You're, they had a good response to it as well. But uh, security done through the public eye and published and talked about, or even what we're talking about here to start breaking this down, hugely important to me. Yeah, it's kind of weird having like a, you know, the shady NSA background where you think a lot of it would be uh, you know, not transparent. But I, I think I learned over the years, and even at the agency itself, like, you see now NSA coming out releasing a lot of some of their internal reverse engineering tools. Yeah. Uh, indicators of compromise where it I'm sure benefits them. But I'm a huge on transparency. Like if you accurately represent an in, you know, a situation, uh, make sure everybody's educated. Like yeah, it puts it at a level playing field, right? And I'm never one to establish blame. So like you said, uh, never hold anybody against whether it's their issue or not. Yeah, no, and it's it's about that levels of transparency. It's one of the reasons that's drawn me to open source over the years too, is being able to see inside the firewall. It was a mystery back when everything was some blob of firmware loaded in a little Linksys box. And I'm like, that doesn't seem right. So that's what, you know, got me into firewalls and got me taken apart once I'm like open source firewalls and we can start seeing what's inside of them I can actually watch the package traversing and of course that leads to discoveries of this shouldn't be traversing <laughs> <laughs> it's always an unexpected like oh sometimes you uh you wish you could put things back in the box but uh yeah I think overall there's probably way more victories for transparency than not yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that really wish we wouldn't have poked into things, but at some point, and uh, that's, I'm going to share it real quick on the screen here. Uh, let me pull that up because we're going to talk about the Kaseya thing real quick. Just, I know this is from a little while ago. Uh, share screen. There we go. So the Kaseya mining payload, and of course, this is a payload. This is also uh, because Kaseya was, you know, is an MSP tool, so it's loaded. It's an RMM tool that is loaded on a lot of computers, so you have access. And mining payloads were really hot in 2018, back before Bitcoin, oh, I don't know, became a little less valuable. <laughs> so yeah. we, it wasn't about exfiltrating data. It's about all about mining and stealing my CPU cycles. You know, that was what all the goals of the hackers were. It kind of is for right now, but it was really hot then. So what was the trigger? What, what, how how'd you guys find this? Let's kind of talk through it a little bit. Yeah, so you, you kind of already alluded to like the a terrible acronym APT. Um, my job was persistence, right? Long-term access at, at the agency. And so we look at things a little bit different. Um, so at Huntress, it's always about how could somebody make a payload automatically start running. And so for us, while there's a lot going on, 
all of a sudden we noticed like several thousand, it was actually probably about tens of thousands of uh, computers that had scheduled tasks that were just abnormally named. You know, they, they didn't hide in plain sight as well as they should have. And so for us, we were like, what in the world is this thing? Like you actually on your screen right there, it says, you know, as illustrated, the foothold was established with a single PowerShell command. Uh, when you're looking at this data set, it's funny how some things that are just poorly done for like op OPSEC by the attackers really stand out as an anomaly. So yeah, we had no clue it was even related to any product or any type of vulnerability. Um, it was just the scale uh, made us realize like, oh no, uh, that was kind of that first indicator of compromise for us. And one of the things I find really interesting is uh, that they pulled from Dropbox. And the reason I say that is uh, being that I do a lot of videos on firewall, people constantly are asking me like, oh, so Siricata would have caught this. Like they think that the firewall, and I think it's just as a Hollywood problem, they breached the firewall as if that's like what really happened. But the reality is you're not going to block Dropbox at the firewall level. So that's why they use it. They know it would pass through any SIM tools, not going to see this and really understand that it's, it's a PowerShell script. It is files being downloaded from Dropbox. That's not suspicious at all. This is one of the reasons I think endpoint protection is absolutely almost in some ways more critical than the firewall uh, because, well, they just, like you said, they didn't do too much obfuscation. They just grabbed something from Dropbox and loaded a PowerShell script, but a firewall wouldn't have seen that at all. And that stuff kills me. Like there's a lot of folks that want to place the blame game. Like you could easily say like Dropbox, you hosted a server, you're, you know, negligent or, uh, I mean, even Kaseya using somebody's RMM for malicious purposes, like like holding a gun manufacturer guilty for someone using a crime. I'm not a big fan of that side of the house. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of weird how you have to nowadays, like attackers are challenged so hard on the process behavior that they've now taken this whole new approach of like, I'm going to use the legitimate good tools and only with these good tools or good websites am I going to use them for nefarious purposes to help minimize my time of getting caught. So I think it's both really crafty. I got to give, you know, hackers props for being innovative. But uh, we as obviously the community have got to do a whole lot to make sure that we're calling these things out, working, you know, vendors quickly reacting, shutting this stuff down. Like that's the stuff I live for, man. Yeah, and it's, it's still defense in depth. It's not that I say you don't need the other components, but you need all the components all together and there's just layers and pieces in there. And as we develop all these fancy tools, the next thing that we know happens is the hackers, it's getting harder for them, but they're going to get better at it. They're going to do the next thing. And so I find that kind of interesting, but uh, that's where we see uh, this WIPRO and oh. WIPRO. I don't know how we say that one. I'm bad at yeah, I think it's WIPRO. I heard it on their, uh, on, on their uh, sales call or their, their quarterly oh. earnings report. At least it sounded like it was WIPRO. So. Yeah. And they were using, uh, let me jump back to the screen sheet here, because they were using uh, the Screen Connect tool, which is obviously ConnectWise tool, uh, was a big component of it not and it's not a compromise in screen connect but it uh it actually caused some confusion because i noticed in this this is all going on behind the scenes there's the before krebs gets to publish stuff these companies are sometimes aware there's ndas involved um because they're trying to investigate i noticed that our screen connect sessions and we updated and it solved it we're getting flagged as malware which doesn't sound right but now that they released some of this information and Screen Connect was one of the tools, they had compromised in order to do this, but not compromise it as a upstream vendor attack, but they got into the infrastructure at WePro. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of folks, it was, that's the downfall sometimes of sharing uh, information like uh, too transparently. You're exactly right. Like that link that says a list of indicators. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah, if you, if you click yep. that. Somewhere. So if you take a look at these files, like those EXEs and DLLs, those are all 100% legitimate software from ConnectWise, not vulnerable. It's the legit software. And unfortunately, some folks like knee-jerk reaction was anything that has these hashes must be malicious, which like this BS. It's like, uh, once again, saying like every cop's gun that was made by Beretta must be malicious because a Beretta was used in a, uh, you know, a shooting. Right. So, it's, it, it's silly. I'm looking at it to see if I have the link for... Uh, my virus totals thing. I had uploaded because ours got flagged and I was like, whoa, why is this out of the blue getting so flagged everywhere? And I don't have the link anymore. I sent it to their support people and they're like, oh, you need to do an update. You need to do this. And, but yeah, these are, it makes you panic at first for me. It just has a, a, another MSP, another IT vendor going, why is my tool? Did something happen that I didn't know about? Well, no, these companies, like you said, these are legit things, but they're using the hashes and going, no, they're not. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, ConnectWise, the software wasn't vulnerable. It wasn't, you know, they literally did nothing wrong. But the irony of the whole thing is 
somebody's knee jerk reaction caused it to get signatured. It also is funny, like what you said about uh, the solution to it was updating the software, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> and if you think about that, what type of signature was used? It was probably just a static hash because think about it, Screen Connect, they didn't rebuild all their features. No. You know, they gave you an update, it was probably a recompiled version that changed the hash, but that was enough to get around. So yeah, the add, add a space in the code and recompile so the hash changes, all right, now it's fixed. <laughs> uh, it happens, I mean, not everybody's that way. Almost no. most of vendors use like, you know, application behavior and stuff like that, heuristics. Yeah. But it makes you scratch your head sometimes when you're like, wait, Screen Connect was getting flagged. I downloaded a new recompiled version the next day and it's no longer getting flagged. Was that because it's now whitelisted? Or is it just because it's a different hash and different, you know? Yeah. Now, in, this is, um, it was kind of funny. I was listening to Steve Gibson's podcast and he's got a new tool out there and he got a new DigiCert signing certificate uh, for compiling and he realized the heuristics flagged it because the cert was too new. Yep. So oh, flagging yeah. it. So, and there wasn't enough indicators. So he said the solution he had to fuel, fool the heuristics was to re-sign a bunch of his products that get downloaded all the time. So that new signing cert were in all of his old previous products. So then it would have a fingerprint that was common across software. He went through like a debrief and I'm like, that's fascinating way to get around it. But that's also why we've seen companies get their signing certificate, which is obviously something that should never get stolen. But I think Komodo had an incident not that long ago where someone was reusing their signing cert or in the case of the Asus malware, uh, where you know it's an upstream attack to get something with a trusted signing cert to get that mail. The shadow hammer, I believe, was the yeah, yeah. You're exactly right. That ASUS vulnerability where the uh, some of the samples were straight up signed with the legit ASUS signing certificate. So yeah, so it's it's still ways to get around, and it comes back down to monitoring your endpoints and uh, trying to figure that out. But yeah, that is, oh, this is such a mess here. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. I didn't realize that, uh, that the folks were using that method to be able to get their software like more reputable. But you know, what's a cool analogy on that is like a lot of companies that send uh, email and marketing, what you do is you don't put your new server out there and just start blasting email because you're so new, your reputation is low. So right. there's an actual like legitimate marketing procedure to warm your servers where you send a little bit of email over time to trusted addresses till you get the reputation. That's a crazy idea that like, you know, you could use a signing certificate the same way, establish your reputation by warming. Yeah, by warming it, by doing all the, yeah, recompiling your old software that's popular. So there's enough samples of that certificate out there with across the love antivirus products that then you can compile your, like this is, it's interesting the things software developers have to do to be inconvenienced <laughs> in order in order to go, no, we're legitimately a genuinely proper company doing good things. We just want our tools to get out there. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I know you probably don't, don't do tons of development. Um, we obviously got a dev team on our house. And one of the ways that we've been hoping to see more like security vendors take things more serious is um, some of the EV or extended validation uh, certificates require a hardware token. Yes. And so the benefit of that is like, you know, the, I think in theory is theoretically, if you're a hardware based extended validation token, there should be some assumption unless you had a physical security compromise, which obviously could still be stolen, but a hell of a lot harder to remotely gain access from some foreign country and steal somebody's physical certificate. Um, so hopefully there, there's maybe more of that. I'd love to see that component come in to like helping establish reputation. Yeah, uh, that's actually something he had mentioned was that I was seeing if I could find a picture of it, but Digi, DigiCert has a little dongle that you plug in uh, for the signing code cert. Actually, uh, I found it real quick. I'll throw it up here, but it's kind of cool. Um, I imagine you guys have something similar for signing yours. Yeah, ours is like a little smart card. Um, so okay. it's not a USB drive, but ours is like, um, if you've ever seen like a, a military common access card or anything okay. else, oh, it's, it's a lot like the chip on your credit card. It, yeah. But it's just a white little token that we plug in uh, for ours. But we actually use DigiCert as well. I, I wonder if when we uh, renew, if we'll get the new USB drives. Yeah, it's kind of, it's it's novel and it's, it's coming back to needing something physical to plug in, like you said, to get this signed. Because obviously you never want that stolen. You don't want, once you, because revoking certificates is not as, simple as a process as it should be it's one that's been discussed a lot is how do we revoke companies that have their signing search stolen it's not easy your system can't continues to trust it for a while even though we have an av update for it so it's another component that we just really got to keep that locked down <laughs> oh man yeah so that's uh 
Uh, that's a, I mean, that's actually the easiest way when we were looking at that WePro incident that was saying um, whether that ConnectWise software was actually abused or not. There was no clarification right at first. There was, they just said it was, it was seeded, I think is what Brian Krebs' words were. So we had to really figure out, like, was there somebody that modified it, backdoored it? And the easiest way for us was right away of saying, like, look, the private key wasn't stolen. Yep, this is still validated against the private key. These DLLs and EXEs that were assigned. So you're right, for a vendor, it could add, like, huge benefit for even, like, researchers that are doing that due diligence to say, like, yep, sign. And as long as it's not an ASUS supply chain type issue, you know, it's a quick way to validate. Yeah. And hopefully in... Whenever we do some of these debriefs, and I noticed even in a debrief on the WePro one, uh, Mimi Cats was used. And like, how are some of these old tools still getting in there? That's that just tells me that there's something wrong. And in, in that, if if any of these old tools get by them, I'm like, well, they didn't have something up to date. They're not using, or they allow someone to work from home who had something on their computer. Uh, those are all policies that I hopefully through more public exposure uh, of these companies and and the ways they got in we have them going, oh yeah, I guess we shouldn't let Bob use his kid and share, share the Minecraft computer and this <laughs> and, and get on there. But minor issues, right? My minor inconveniences. <laughs> yeah, minor and things like that. Um, and the next one was, we, we started talking about this before and I'll uh, jump over here to that, is the uh, Fin team, Trojanized Team Viewer against government targets. Now, oh, yeah, that was the hotness this week, right? Like just a couple yeah. days ago. A couple days ago. And, and what I, it's back to the same thing. It's Team Viewer is not, it's not like Team Viewer themselves are compromised, but Team Viewer is a trusted product for doing screen sharing and remote management in the IT space. So why not use it to uh, infect this? Yeah, I, you know, it's funny as no, none of these companies would ever use it and they shouldn't use it. Please, if you're watching, don't use this as a marketing technique. But it's almost like a huge compliment that the attackers are so confident in these products working that they actually use it for like their data exfiltration and, and things along those lines. Like, uh, you know, what, what better backhanded compliment than people even trust us so much to do their shady things with? Yeah, and it's well crafted here. I, they have the whole breakdown of how they do the decoy documents, how they get them in there. Um, marked as top secret. That's oh god, that's great. <laughs> I, I would open that right. Why, why would you not want to see something like that? Yeah, and then I, this is once again this is back to that transparency. This is that uh, checkpoint, and I'll leave a link in the show notes to this. Uh, but they're walking through each step of it very transparently, so we can understand it. So, well, anyone who's you know writing countermeasures to this can understand how this is working. But this is impressive uh, from the attacker standpoint. But <laughs> it's a, it's also back to the uh, being careful and the upstream. Whoever provides your IT, you have to trust them because it that sounds like where the compromise happened. They took over with team viewer and moving on, moved through the system. Is that correct? I'm just yeah, not reading it, some of it. I, I think both in the, this one here, the checkpoint issue was, was used for targeting government customers as well as the, uh, the WePro issue. And there, there was, I, I guess a couple other large IT outsourcers, managed service providers that also were compromised in that uh, same WePro style attack. But it was exactly like you said, I'm not necessarily caring about the IT service provider so much or the IT department so much is how do I use that access to get into something more exciting? And I can tell you like, that's a legitimate strategy is to swim upstream. Like why go through the front door that's largely locked and has cameras and barricades and maybe a security guard when you could walk through the side door that, uh, you know, maybe a little less scrutiny or maybe has a little bit more access, right? I mean, MSPs typically have a pretty solid internal security as well. But once you get past it, if you, if you could be that authenticated person, right? It's kind of like putting on the security uniform now. Once you, you're yeah. able to put on the security guard uniform, now people extend you a little level of trust. Well, and, and it's kind of a mix. Um, I interact with a lot of MSPs uh, in doing some help and on social projects. And unfortunately, there's a few of them. And I've done everything to be as polite as possible, but we just updated one of them. Uh, what they contracted is they had a bunch of screen connect and they were stuck because it was a Linux server and they didn't understand to update it. They hadn't rolled an update in five years, five okay. years that the server was running on and everything was exposed. No firewall, SSH, everything open, password authentication allowed. Their only answer was, well, we have a strong password and it hasn't got cracked yet. But I'm like, 
like there's dirty cow. There's like a tunnel. There's a long list of vulnerabilities that I, based on your kernel version, like you are wide open to. And this is where sometimes it gets unfortunate when companies get focused on money. So you really have to be careful because they're like, well, it costs money to expend it. And this is a conversation we got into at the hacking uh, event last night was a guy, his company says, our deal is worth $4 million. It's going to cost us $2 million to fix it. Which, which one becomes the priority? Getting the next sale or putting my dev team to work at updating some infrastructure that we know could get popped? Yeah. Um, close that sale is what the bean counter said. And he's like, well, that's what we did. He, go, he, he was being gracefully like very uh, quiet about what company I actually worked for. But he's like, these are some of the serious problems we have at my company. I'm a DevOps engineer there and I, I kind of want to leave and I may, cause my name might get tarnished with the downfall when someone does go ahead and do it. Cause it, it was directly related to the Atlassian and Confluence uh, things that they've had some major problems out there. And if you're not familiar with those particular products, they can be difficult to update would be probably a polite way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> not nice PC plug there. Yeah, I, I did my video the other day on it. What happens when? Because someone did a nice write up on what happens when you run Confluence as root instead of as its own user, and then you don't update it, and then you have a public facing. And according to Shodan, there's about what twenty thousand, twenty two thousand public facing ones, and how many of those are going to get updated? <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot of like in software development. Obviously, I'm biased because that's my background, but a lot of like the continuous integration servers like Jenkins or Hudson and things like that similar approach, you know, access the source code running as root. And it's funny, every now and then my Twitter feed, I'll see somebody of like new remote code exploit for Jenkins. And it just kind of reiterates that people are still targeting these. Like, why not? Yeah, actually, I uh, need to let me switch over to the Twitter feed here. So we got, uh, yeah, so I stumbled on to why, while we were talking, I, you know, we were sharing about those IOCs. And I remembered I, I had a Twitter feed on it. So one of those slides actually shows that instance you were discussing earlier of uh, even though legit software sometimes gets flagged, it doesn't like throw any vendor under the bus. But I think it's that one so far many of the on-disk IOCs will only uh, confirm the presence of legit Screen Connect, digitally signed with a valid Screen Connect software certificate. But you can see in that picture right below there is uh, two of 70 of the engines were already, and that was cutting edge. That was like, right after those uh, were uh, disclosed by Brian Krebs. You can see that tweet right underneath that picture shows the actual uh, you know, virus total interface. And you click that image there. That's uh, showing two of the 70 AV vendors were at least flagging it. And it got up to something like 14 out of 70, I think, by the end of the day. Yeah. And that's, that's uh, definitely important. I mean, they have to start because then it kind of comes downstream. Everyone starts flagging it and then we can start finding it. One of the other things about Screen Connect, uh, just for people who may not be familiar with the product, I mean, we use it and it's uh, the backend PowerShell commands. We've even used it to install Huntress on, a, on some of our machines real quick. We could just, you just issue a command through PowerShell through the backend of Screen Connect, like here, make this thing happen with completely no user interaction. You have full system. So you're actually at like ring zero because it running as you know, full admin, even if there's a user with a lesser privilege logged in. Um, Screen Connect is awesome for that, but it also is what makes it so scary. <laughs> if, if your yeah. instance of Screen Connect gets compromised, it's an excellent, excellent attack vector. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? Yeah. Um, the, those that use a handgun to defend themselves at home are also a terrifying thing for kids. So, uh, you know, yeah. you put gun locks on it, you, you, you treat your, uh, your security tools the same way your screen connect tools the same way. Yeah, and this is something I've told people, like even our screen connect server, in the event that I am unavailable and an Apache problem comes out, because we actually proxy it through Apache, um, it auto updates and someone's like, well, what if it breaks? I'm like, I'd rather have it broken than compromised any yep. day of the week. Broken yep. is aggravating. Compromised is, all right, guys, we got to get the cybersecurity insurance out. Uh, we have to talk about this. How bad is it? What got happened? Those, those are much, much worse conversation than, hey, screen connect broke. <laughs> I have backups. I can restore. Those are all fine. Update these things constantly. Make sure auto updates are a savior because humans are bad at remembering to update things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. E even in the, that was probably my favorite thing out of uh, the ASUS live update incident is, um, gosh, I'm going to, I'm going to forget who it is. I think it's the publisher behind No Starch Press did a uh, Washington Post um, or maybe New York Times, something along those lines article the following day that was like, look, the one takeaway after the ASUS live updater incident is to not disable your live updates. 
even in the risk of supply chain and everything else, that software was doing what it was supposed to do, which is you know, the overall risk of making sure you're getting those updates installed in real time. Obviously, there's the risk of stability and the risk of supply chain, but the answer sure as heck was not stop using automatic updates. Like that was huge. I think it yeah. was Bill Pollock, by the way, that, that did that. Yeah, no, and that's a good point. I've, uh, when I talked about it too, some people like, oh, I just disable all the updates. I'm like, no, 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 that isn't the point. Matter of fact, the live update can update to the version that's not compromised. So <laughs> that's that's a legit thing because this, and this was a super, unless your MAC address was one of the uh, 612 MAC addresses on the list, unless you were among there, it, the payload never activated. So yeah. that's yeah. very targeted. Yeah. Internally, by the way, whether you're red team or, you know, somebody shadier like nation state adversary, like that's an actual business process. A lot of people don't think about hackers like following like legitimate business plan, but stage one of it is to do like target validation. Is this computer valuable enough for me to even care about? So those actors behind it were sophisticated. They realized their time and resources were limited and they used that amazing capability, right? They could have installed ransomware on, Oh yeah. I think Kaspersky said like maybe up to 500,000 or something. Maybe yeah, a huge number. Asus is a massive computer vendor. So it's, this is a massive platform to do things with. Yeah, but they were being surgical. They could have, you know, that code was running, even though the update was only doing the validation, was running on whatever that number was, 500,000 computers. Right. Yeah, they were being surgical and only targeting, you know, 600 and some, so. Yeah, so they wanted something, and until we know a little more detail, if we ever know who those 600 people are, that's going to answer the question of who wanted it. <laughs> yep. so. Yeah, who wanted it and why? Why were you important enough? I'm pretty sure, and even when we were like, like when that happened, we immediately went out. Thankfully, we we're like a big data company, right? So everything we store, even if it's something that's not like persistence, we had information on like every single computer that was running Asus Live Updater. So on the fly, we actually like notified our customers like, hey, this was probably run on your computer. But the biggest thing that we actually notified of folks was like, you're probably not important enough to be one of the 600. Like, yes. no offense, my mom sometimes would ask me, like, Kyle, you work at NSA. Like, are you reading my email? And I'm like, mom, no offense. One, you're a U.S. citizen. Two, you're not that important. I don't have the time nor care about what you're doing. <laughs> I used to work with a guy who was a conspiracy theorist. And I'd had enough one day, and I just yelled. I was like, Brad, you're just not that important. I'm sorry. The government's not coming for you. And it was around year 2000 because he thought that's when the NSA was going to come get him. I'm like, why would they come get you? You're not that yeah. interesting. <laughs> You don't yeah. like anything. You're actually not even a great tech. Yeah. <laughs> Are you really going for the? Yeah. I, I just, I had had like, was, you know, if you remember the 2000s, I was working in corporate ID back then. And so everyone, want, we had to do all these compliance things because I worked in at the automotive level of whether or not it was Y2K compliant. It was like busy work of stupidity of if it has a clock in it, we had to put stickers on monitors to say that they were Y2K compliant. It was one of the dumbest things I did in my career because <laughs> you couldn't convince it until we certified it. I'm like, it doesn't have a clock in it, but did you check it? I'm like, it's a monitor. <laughs> so we had to put stickers on things we checked. It was, I got it. The phone systems failed the Y2K. And they were all like, how do we do the testing? I'm like, I'm going to change the time. Yeah. Everyone said to me like, well, shouldn't you do more thorough than that? I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to change the time to 2K and then I'm going to roll it back to the correct time and see if it crashed. <laughs> yeah, gosh. Oh. oh, I spent so much time doing that. But anyways, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, sometimes people think they're too important. Unless you're, that's 600, which uh, I... I don't like the way Kaspersky did it. And I did probably they did it for attention where you had to put your Mac address in and I gave you a yes or no, but that piece of reverse engineering, their name eludes me, but I I've did a video specifically on how they, they gave such a great detail of how they reverse engineered and pulled and extracted out salted hashes of Mac addresses. And uh, that was a cool reverse engineering. Yeah. That was skylight cyber to give those yeah. guys mad props. They spent oh the yeah. And they were awesome. Just, like, skylight a, just cyber. like a capture the flag event, right? Trying to reverse engineer and figure it out. Yes. So, that's actually a good point. You know, I guess there is some privacy there that you want to respect somebody's privacy. There was also some things like just the same way that people like, you know, misconstrued it, like RMMs or products uh, from, uh, you know, vendors being malicious. Um, some people took the wrong approach. They were like, look, if you look at the MAC addresses, there's a high level of Intel MAC addresses. Clearly, there must be something with Intel. And it's like, well, no, that's not how this worked. It had nothing to do with Intel. had nothing to do with the vendor. They just happened to be running 
a common product, right? Yeah, um, and these vendors, I mean, they genuinely want all the products to be secure. They don't want their reputation. And I feel uh, the majority of all these MSP, larger ones that I've dealt with, you know, uh, ConnectWise and SolarWinds, they, the engineers, I've actually met a few of them, like they are absolutely want their product to be top secure. They do a good job and everything else. Um, so that's, it, it's, that's not where these problems lie. It's sometimes the people who use the tooling. And I, I try to dig through the back channels of the WePro one and, I feel I've gotten two mixed things and I see people arguing in a couple of the hacker channels. Some say I worked there, their operational security was not as good as it could have been. And other people said it was good. It depended on what division you worked in. So I want these, I hope they give really good debriefs of exactly how a phishing email got through and what the entire movement was uh, on there. I don't know if you listen to Darknet Diaries. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah. I think some of those that they do of like the actual dumps or going through like their incidents are brilliant. Um, Kaspersky, ironically, uh, a lot of people forget that Kaspersky themselves got compromised in like 2016. They called it Dooku 2. Mm -hmm. And did this amazing like breakdown of all the ways how they got in, how they did the incident response. They owned their incident. And you could say like, oh, Kaspersky, you could have been negligent, but I think they owned it. They just said, look, this could happen to anybody when somebody like this targets. Uh, did you see a particular like Darknet Diary or incident, or not incident, but a uh, 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 podcast or that actually... Uh, you know, had something like this of, you know, they were calling out or walking through the incident? Uh, not, not the WePro one yet, um, but I've gone through like some of the older ones. Uh, what was that big oil company? They walked through that one. Oh, that was the really Ramco. Good. Yeah, Ramco. Saudi Ramco. Yeah. Yeah, that was really good. Uh, did you, out of the latest one I just finished the other day, which was uh, Jeremy from Marketing. I don't know if you listened to that one. I haven't, I haven't caught on that one. Oh, good red team story. Walking you through of a plant they dropped in to do red teaming. He was Jeremy from Marketing. He wasn't yeah. really Jeremy from Marketing, but you know. <laughs> Uh, it was it was actually it was a good story that gives you absolute and a I, I love the level of detail they get into it of walking through these are the tools I tried using this is how I tried to capture their password hashes this is how I tried to walk through each step of it in depth and that's something um, I appreciate greatly because I we need more content like that because that's what gets people thinking about it oh wow I'm running that and I didn't turn on 2FA because you always have to start with the assumption they've breached a perimeter I even my network is overly complex in some ways because I assume they're already breached everything. Yeah, assume compromise, right? It's yeah. It, assume compromise and work from that threat model makes it harder. And then, you know, test. Uh, so my friends, I invite them over. Uh, they're trusted hackers. They're white hat, but yeah. it's like you can poke at it while you're here. We record uh, how they got hacked on Fridays or one of our shows record. I'm like, and I, they're poking away at stuff all the time. Hey Tom, we found your printer, you know what? Oh yeah. I forgot. I, I hooked something up. <laughs> and I think, cause I mean, you have a huge variety of viewers that, you know, from folks that are getting into security to people that are knee deep, the folks that are in it, that obviously it's tangential even down to like students or, you know, folks in the C-suite that might just want to come here to be able to learn. I think one of the biggest things that your, you know, your, your podcasts and videos on YouTube offer is like, it makes these things more relatable, right? And, and even from like IT folk, I've seen folks have commenting on your videos that are like, look, I never thought that I always treated like my, my pen testers as an adversary or even pen testers commenting of like, I never thought that if I can make these more relatable and you know, get rid of some of the hype, the fear and uncertainty and doubt that uh, can make some of these things more digestible for your viewers. So kudos, dude, by the way. Nobody, nobody ever says that to you. And I appreciate <laughs> that as a viewer of your stuff and obviously hanging with you here, that I think that's huge for you to be able to share those resources. Yeah, no, I, and that's, that's you know, I, people think it's scary and hard to get into, but once they get into it, they go, oh, you know, I, I and one time I want, I almost wanted to like share the story. I have a friend who uh, now works for Adafruit Industries who has a degree in psychology. She never picked up programming, starts it, and within a year, she's got so good at it, she's now giving talks all over the US, and then she's a uh, head Python devices maker at Adafruit. Her degree's in psychology. She spent years working like the medical profession, and she's like, oh, it turns out I really liked Python. I thought it was, I thought computers were scary. Turns out. <laughs> I took just like two books of coding and now she's actually working for a reputable big company doing this and achieving quite a bit. And she's really talented at it. She, uh, I don't know if this year or not, cause I haven't figured out who's involved. There's a, a conference coming up in two weeks. We sponsor all the laptops for the Python coding course. But for the last few years, I know she's been the teacher for it. I can't remember if she had a conflict this year or not, but she, but it's all things like we hold these labs, we hold these events. We invite people out to DC 313, which, you know, our DEF CON meetup here. 
just get more people involved. That's the biggest thing. It's how this gets better. <laughs> gotcha. So, I mean, obviously that's, that's part of the reason why we do these blogs the way we do. You know, some folks have actually asked of like, you know, do, do you feel like you're calling a, a vendor out? And I'm never like, I'm a vendor. I'm telling you right now from one day, hunters will have an incident. It's going to happen. We put everything in place. You'd be crazy to say it's not going to happen. Uh, when it does happen, I'd hope that you come out, you say, hey, it happened. This is what we're doing to make sure it doesn't happen. That would be my biggest thing. And I hope that a level of transparency, uh, you know, runs through and through. And I, I think that's probably why I love groups like, you know, the DEF CON groups or the Black Hat groups or even the old school 2600 groups. They were all about the, like, let's not hide the knowledge. Let's not separate it, right? Yep. Let's, let's bring it to the limelight. So in 2600 uh, where I got my start. I got all the magazines are all dude, stacked still, up. Yeah. But I buy mine in cash from books a million. So yep. I don't have to pay. Uh, I don't. And they close it or I can buy them in cash. I'm a few, I haven't bought some books in a while and I've, as I always pay cash for them. So I'm like, Oh, <laughs> you now we're the tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists. Oh yeah. I mean, man, I've been reading those books since high school and that was nineties for me. So <laughs> nice. Nice. So, all right, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, we'll talk real quick, though. You, so you're easy to find. You usually get hold of on Twitter, on uh, the blog on Huntress Labs, where you guys are always uh, talking about security search. And full disclosure, we're a user of your product. We're really happy with it. Uh, I'm going to do a separate video talking a little bit about your product and how it uses. Because people, you, and you have a free demo, by the way. You can sign up. So if you're curious, you don't have to take either of our words for it. You can actually just start playing yeah, with it. I'm a huge put your money where your mouth is. Show me, don't tell me. So... I'll be, yeah. and I'm sure the salespeople would love to talk to you. It's just way easier to kick the tires on anything. Yeah, and I, that's, that's always an awesome, and that's what, of course, made it easy for me. I didn't even have, like, some salespeople I had to get through and sign up for this BS. You guys like, oh, here, just sign up for your account. I'm like, oh, this was simple, and uh, <laughs> the deployment was easy, and your engineering team has been amazing. They found things. We used them specifically for a cleanup on a new client and uh, because we knew they needed it, <laughs> and your debriefs you give on how to remove the specific tools from that computer. I'll cover all that a whole separate video, but it's impressive. It does, you guys just have a excellent product. The the human element is what makes it interesting because uh, we, everyone wants to throw the words AI and all this machine learning automation. At some point, people need to work at these knock teams, need to yeah. do some analysis and actually get involved. Uh, it's so as, a, as I understand it, we still haven't created the, Singularity machine is smarter than us just yet. So, yeah, well, I know well, Elon's read about it. Skynet research, but we're not quite there. Right. right. Until we're there, we're still going to be finding uh, payloads and Dropbox. Yeah. <laughs> <It's suspicious. laughs> Touche, <bro. laughs> oh, that was great. So, all right. Um, I'll leave links to everywhere you can find about uh, you, Huntress, and all that. And uh, thanks for thanks for coming on and doing this interview, man. This has been fun. Yeah, we'll this is fun. Again fun. Sometime. And I'll, definitely I'll be uh, commenting and retweeting some of the stuff, especially because these attacks, they only get more persistent. Hopefully security gets better through all this transparency, though. Cool. Thanks, brother, for having me. This is tons of fun. Oh, last thing. Uh, I love what you said before uh, uh, last time we talked was how companies have safety and they brag about, you know, 30 days, 40 days without an OSHA incident <laughs> or an accident. We, like, you, we need that. Like days without incident should be just as much of a bragging. Days when we didn't get fish, days we didn't get at the companies. It's the same thing. You should be proud of your days without that. I love that. So, Yeah, man. I mean, you could probably have a whole video on that type of stuff. But uh, I yeah. hope bringing those just to celebrate security, right? Yeah. Build it into your business. Hey, we haven't had an incident in 270 days. Like, that's not a reason to get mad, right? That's no. a reason to celebrate. And it's not a reason to fire your tech vendor. Well, they don't do anything. I haven't had oh, an incident. Yeah, <laughs> yeah clearly we get bored in the doing their job. <laughs> All right, I'm going to jump off. Take care, man. Yeah, thank you so much. Cheers. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to subscribe to this channel to see more content, hit that subscribe button and the bell icon, and maybe YouTube will send you a notice when we post. If you want to hire us for a project that you've seen or discussed in this video, head over to lawrencesystems.com where we offer both uh, business IT services and consulting services and are excited to help you with whatever project you want to throw at us. Also, if you want to carry on the discussion further, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can keep the conversation going. And if you want to help the channel out in other ways, we offer affiliate links below, which offer discounts for you and a small cut for us that does help fund this channel. And once again, thanks again for watching this video and see you on next time.